Um, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the class. Just a couple of uh, quick announcements before we get to the uh, talk. So tomorrow we have Andre Norken presenting at IT Forum and he's going to be talking about video compression. I know we haven't really touched video compression at all in class so far, but next class we are going to briefly touch upon it. Uh, but I think Andre is an like expert. He has been in the area forever. So I would strongly encourage you guys to like come and also learn a bit more about how videos are compressed. Uh, quick thing like um, to tomorrow Saki's our, uh, office hour is going to be in person. Um, and next week, my office hour is shifted from Wednesday to Monday. There's a night force. Do check the timing change. Uh, just a reminder that homework three has been out now for one and a half weeks. And it's easy to forget that it exists because we also gave a long time to you guys, but don't forget about it. It's due next Sunday, so you should ideally be already working on it. Um, and finally, uh, we're going to release some project final logistics, uh, hopefully by uh, this weekend or early next week by Monday. Um, and that will basically have like schedule, etc., for the next Thursday's class where like we're going to have the final project presentation. The expectation is that you are not present there only for your presentation, but rather for everyone else's presentation as well. So it's a full class. Don't think you need to be just there for whatever five, 10 minutes your slot is. And we'll also have uh, some refreshments. So you'll have like food and like snacks to go around. So it's, it's not going to be as, uh, it's going to be a bit informal from that perspective. So do join for food, hang around, just try to see what, what your, uh, other classmates have been working on just to get a broader picture. Okay, cool. Um, so today's lecture is basically going to be like it's titled vaguely for a reason. It's going to be around humans and compression. So it's going to be slightly different than what uh, kind of things we have been doing so far. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, okay. So, so far, uh, we have covered a lot of ground and lossy compression in the second half of this course. Uh, we have seen how quantization acts as a core mechanism of like introducing loss in our framework. We have seen theoretical underpinnings of like the rate distortion uh, trade-off like uh, during Saki's lecture. We continued that to understand like what are the optimal solutions in case of like when you have Gaussian uh, sources and mean square error distortions like when we learned about transform coding, right? Finally, we took this theory and we showed that like, okay, how, how does image compression works? In particular, like we looked in detail how JPEG works. And finally, last class, you saw a little bit about like how learned image compression uh, like techniques work. So now this class is going to be about something slightly different. So this class is based on the realization that all multimedia eventually is consumed by humans, right? And so what's the role of sens human sensory perception when you go on to design uh, these lossy multimedia systems, right? Like, and so we'll be looking into questions like why some of the design decisions were even made in, Im in image compressors we saw, like for example, in JPEG's case. Uh, we'll see how can we further improve image video compression when you start accounting for like, okay, humans are not perfect beings, like, the, like we, have, we have our own biases, our own ways of, uh, doing things and how can we account for that to actually gain uh, advantage in terms of, uh, let's say, in particular in this class, we'll talk about image video compression, uh, but you'll also see the general theme of like how we are exploiting human, uh, human sensory perception, essentially. And then another thing is like you can, so far we have mostly been focused upon like mean square error as a distortion metric. Kedar mentioned mean absolute error during the learned image com uh, um, compression class, like as another maybe distortion metric, but these are like very well defined and well understood distortion metrics. Humans don't do mean square error as a distortion metric, right? And so we'll also see like what's the right distortion, so as to say, to work around. Like it's like how do you actually think about distortion when it comes to multimedia compression? Okay. And so like I have. <laughs> I've collected material for this lecture from a bunch of different places. I've hyperlinked all of them on these slides. I do encourage you guys to like go back home and check out some of these, like whatever interests you. Uh, some of them are like, I would say almost very interesting papers, like even landmark papers like SM. And then there are some interesting blogs, videos. In particular, there is this course called Psych 221, which is called Image Systems Engineering. Um, I would uh, like highly recommend, like if today's class is something which intrigues you, 
I would highly recommend you to like go and check out this course. Uh, I think it's offered in fall, so maybe you guys missed it, but still, I think a lot of material is also available online. So it's just amazing. Like this book called Foundations of Vision is again like it's a very, very nice read to just like check out some of the material. And I want to give a disclaimer even before we start, like some of the material which I'm gonna present, it's gonna be very hand wavy coverage, especially like if if you know anything about like how neuroscientifically or psychovisually like these things are done. And so and, and that's intentional because there is so much we, we can cover in this class. I would I would rather spend time in like communicating the basic principles rather going into like accurate specific details. But again, there is a lot more to what we are going to talk about today. We are going to touch it at a surface level. Cool. Uh, any questions so far or let's continue. Yeah, nice. So let's start with, with a teaser. Okay. So here uh, I have just like printed out information about basically an MP3 file, which is like uh, Shubham's favorite <laughs> audio file. If you guys have already seen homework three by now. This is like just a Pokemon theme song, just like printed out like, and it's encoded using one of the audio compressors. Um, and I've just printed out details about what it's compressed using. So like, for example, the format version is MPEG audio. Uh, it's like three, M three megabytes. Uh, it's lossily compressed, so on and so forth, right? So like the first thing, so, but here I see like two different things. The first question really is like, so you see a sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz. And actually, if you like print out, like if you see encoded audios, 44.1 kilohertz, you'll see is like a very common sampling rate for most of your encoded audios. Does anyone has any idea like why 44.1? Yeah, so the answer is like humans can only hear up to 20 kilohertz. So humans audible range, again, depends on age, lots of specific things, but ballpark numbers are 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So a human can't hear above 20 kilohertz. And if you know about Nyquist sampling rate, that would mean like you don't need anything more than 40 kilo samples per second to go about like reconstructing audio, which is perceivable to human, right? So if you are compressing this audio for humans, then going up to 40 kilohertz is a nice thing. Obviously, if you're compressing this audio, let's say for a dog, like they can hear much higher frequencies and like the, the kind of lossy compression you are getting might be much worse. So right here, immediately you see like an application of uh, like that human's audio system has like this specific range, perceptual range. And that's why we go with this number in like compressed files, like it's very common. By the way, just a fun, fun aside, like it's not exactly 40, it's 44.1. And that's because of sort of two reasons. Like one is to, because our filters are not perfect. So you, you don't have like sharp low pass filters or band pass filters. So you need to give some room for Im imperfect filter design. And then 44.1 in particular is like very interesting because uh, this number allows you to like down sample 44.1 at like various different prime factors. So that's, that's the reason like 44100 was chosen. So you can like decimate it by two, three, five, so on and so forth, like seven, I think as well, if I recall correctly. So yeah, so just, just a <laughs> fun fact. Another thing which you see here is like, you see channels. So you see like, it's, it's encoded using two channels in particular. And any guesses why? Yeah, I have written that. What does that mean? Like why, why two, why stereo? Yeah, exactly. Like this is this is what my answer was going to be. It's because you have two ears, right? And both of these ears are perceiving typically slightly different intensities when a physical sound source is being projected to you. And so if you take care of that fact, you can actually get much higher quality, right? So this is just to give you a sense right up front, like, okay, even in audio compression, we are using a lot of these perceptual factors uh, during the compression uh, pipeline. Okay. So then another teaser. So this is this is an image which actually I think again Kedar showed during one of his image compression lectures, uh, where so you have an image A, um, and then you obtain these five different images starting from this source image. Okay, uh, and so question really for you guys is so let's say I have only given you A, okay, which ones amongst let's say B, C, D, E, or F would you choose uh, as being closer to A? No wrong answer, anyone? 
Okay. Yeah, we have a consensus for B. That's great. Now imagine a compressor which was designed as mean square error as a distortion metric. Okay. So which one of these B, C, D, E, or F do you think this compressor would choose? If it if if you ask this compressor which is a better image, just purely from distortion first perspective. All of them, okay. <laughs> so I got to answer all of them. It's because I think uh, you know the source of this image and Kedar has talked, so you're giving attention in the class. That's great. So actually in this, in this particular case, all these images B, C, D, E, e and F actually have exactly same mean square error when you compare it with A, right? So if you were trying to, let's say all these five also have the same rate, in that case, a compressor doesn't really care like which of these uh, images you end up at if you were just worried about mean square error as a distortion metric. But clearly, like when I asked this question from human perspective, I heard a resounding like uh, B as like something which you would prefer. And so this, this is again, I would say like one of the classic examples where like people realized uh, very clearly that like, okay, mean square error is not the right metric to maybe optimize for if you are doing multimedia image and video compression. Cool. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. Let's suppose there is some function that humans minimize when they're trying to observe image quality. Right? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that says that, that that one can maximize global minimum? Like, what if there are like two AI that would. Need not be. <laughs> Like people, so there is a whole field. We'll we'll talk a little bit about it on perceptual metric design, um, and there have been different kinds of work, uh, but like so, okay. Th there is something called metric spaces, right? Like abstract metric spaces, and so in some sense, like what you are trying to ask is that like whatever the human metric space is, like if I try to like go about optimizing along that metric space, is it convex? Like what 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 is its properties? Uh, in terms of variables. And it's really hard to kind of pinpoint that. Like human vision is like, it's, it's, there are like lots of illusions, artifacts, et cetera, which you need to model and like things. We have good models under certain settings, but models seldom generalize to all possible settings. And that's really the hard problem when it comes to optimizing for like human perception. We'll, we'll see some examples, I think, to go ahead. Cool. Any other questions? Nice. Okay. So in this class, like my goal for you guys is basically to do this. So we'll get some preliminary understanding of how human vision works and like not this human vision, like eyes, um, right? We'll see its role in the design of traditional compressors such as JPEG. So there were some design decisions which Kedal left for future. We are going to cover them today, why they were made. Uh, we'll learn more about perceptual metrics. So like the question which Noah just asked, like how do you actually, can, can you think of like how humans are actually doing this A versus B comparison and like come up with a quantitative space to optimize over it. Um, and finally, we'll see like how can we account into these perceptual properties in general in the rate distortion framework. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, so the first part is all about human vision. So no more audio. Everything's going to be about image and human vision going ahead. Uh, so this is just a schemat uh, schematic of an human eye anatomy. And you might have seen this in your introductory biology classes, but just to revise, like basically your light comes in from the left. You have some eye lens, which focuses this light somewhere at the back of your eye, where you have a layer called retina, which essentially does the transduction. It converts whatever light falling into your eye into some electrical signals. And finally, this signal is transmitted uh, through the uh, optic nerve to like your other regions of the brain, okay? And the basic idea here is that like actually human optics, like as soon as we start talking about human optics, there is uh, right at this point itself, there is like physical implications of like how human optics has been designed, which puts like features and limitations to how human vision works, okay? For example, like let's say you have just a line source in front of you, a screen with just like a single line. And when you are seeing it on your eye, your eye has is basically going to use this lens to like converge and make some image at the back of the retina, right? So if you think about the intensity, like physical intensity of the light which is falling, in terms of screen position, you have a delta function. So as to say, you have a single line. But as soon as you see what intensity of light is actually falling at retina, 
that's that's no more a delta function. It's going to be a smoothly varying function. And like the kind of functional properties of this variance depends on like your all the optics of the eye, which is at play. Okay. So you might have heard terms in past like maybe chromatic aberrations or like just uh, yeah, like the the reason these kind of terms kind of come into play is because of like exactly this optics and how it plays with like different wavelengths of light, which is what you are perceiving in your daily world. So more specifically, so this is, seems like a complicated diagram. Don't worry about it. We'll break it down. So if you focus on the retina, so retina is where like the action is really happening, right? Like that's where your light intensity falls and then it's converted into some, it's, it's encoded in some form, which eventually is going to be processed by the brain, right? So if you like just take a snippet and zoom out how your retina looks like, this is like your retina has many different layers, okay? But the main layers are basically, let's say you are, you uh, went out to watch Top Gun and you're watching this thing, what's really happening. Uh, so what happens is like the first main important layer in the retina are these cells called photoreceptors, which are doing the actual transduction. So these are converting like photons or light intensity, which is falling on your retina to electrical signals. Okay. And in particular, there are two very specific types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. And this has a very direct impact in whatever we do in image video compression as we'll see soon, okay? So like one of the main important layers is this photoreceptors. And then the second main, the, the second main important layer is this something called RGCs, which is retinal ganglion cells. Don't worry about the term. Uh, these are just essentially spiking neurons. So these are the ones, so if you have ever heard of electrical spikes, brain, brain processes signals in terms of spikes. So these are the cells which are essentially converting your whatever transduced information into some specific electrical spikes, in, in essence, encoding the visual information which, which, which fell onto your retina. Okay. And something really cool about retina, I, I, I must say, is that like, it's nothing like the camera, right? Like you, we, all of us are very used to thinking about camera, all the images as this rectangular array of like W by H pixels, like RGB different colors and so on and so forth. But retina is nothing like camera, actually. In, in fact, actually, like, uh, in fact, actually, like, if you see, like, how these RGCs encode information, it's actually been known that, like, what, there are almost 20 different parallel channels, 20 different independent image encodings, which are sort of happening at this RGC layer, and then being transmitted to the visual cortex. So it's like, given the same image, you are sort of doing, like, 20 different feature extraction and then transmitting all those features back to the brain which is not like how you are storing information right now at all, right? It's like already at RGC level, you, you have some sort of uh, amazing uh, processing of, of the visual information following into your eye happening, right? And this is sort of what, like these different colors, you can think of as, um, them as like sampling visual information at different uh, coarseness or like different styles and so on and so forth. Yeah. And yeah, so, Sorry, so far everyone with me? All right. So continuing, so I just talked to you about like rods and cones as photoreceptors, right? So in this plot, what I'm showing is that uh, you can think of like any light falling on your retina in terms of these visual angles, like where it's falling on the retina in, in some sense spherical angles. So roughly like if you put out your, uh, if you put your arm out, and like sort of the width of your fist is roughly two degrees of visual angle, just like us, just to give you a sense or like sun or moon, which you see far away is typically like 0.5 degrees of visual angle. So that's like basically falling in some very small, like 0.5 degree worth of uh, region on the retina. That's what, that's what it means. And this is like one, one way in which a lot of these, uh, uh, what's the right word, retinal characterizations uh, have typically been done. And so here, like in, in this plot on the right, what I'm showing is on the x-axis is this angle relative to the fovea. So fovea is, think of it as the center point, sort of, which is coming back right at the back of the eye. So you can look at like the visual angle, which is there relative to the fovea. And on the y-axis, what I'm showing is basically the number of receptors which are present. So these rods and cones are your transducers, right? So these are your sensors, so as to say, like these are the ones which are sensing the light. So like sort of like pixels, uh, but not really. <laughs> um, 
And so here on the y-axis, I'm showing you the number of receptors which are there per square millimeter, okay? And there are a couple of immediate interesting things which you see. So here the dashed line is basically cones and the solid line which you see here uh, are rods. So like the first interesting scene which you immediately see is that at certain angle away, like there is no cones or no rods. And that's basically your blind spot. You might have heard like, you know, blind spot during driving actually, that's very common or even otherwise, like you have a blind spot somewhere here. You Like if, if you look straight and focus completely uh, and you put your arm roughly like 20 arms away, like, like right now I can't see at all. I can sort of see what's happening here, what's happening here. I can't see my arm at all. And that's like, very known fact like and that's basically the blind spot exists because you have an optic nerve the, you, you need to send out information through some place right and so that's the reason this blind spot exists um okay so that's kind of one interesting thing which you see here the next interesting thing which you see is that like if you look near the fovea you have a sharp jump of cones right so most of your cones are sort of sitting right at the fovea but if you look at the solid curve, like the solid line, there are hardly any rods uh, near the fovea. Most of the rods are like situated away from the fovea, right? Like they are away from zero. And this has, this has some very interesting implications. Um, um, so like I'll, I'll talk about those implications in a second, but roughly like to, to actually connect, connect back to uh, even like why why do we care about all of this like why am i like talking about biology suddenly in a compression course right uh, so rods are responsible for encoding the intensity in visual signals so when you have some and i'm gonna use this term very very vaguely intensity so like if you are someone who understands a lot of physics and biology like i apologize in advance like I'm not gonna be clear about it at all, like whether I'm talking about physical luminosity signals, whether I'm talking about digital signals, but we can talk about it in, at a later point. That doesn't matter for now. Uh, but your rods are essentially responsible for encoding intensity, right? Just the amount of light. And there are actually 100 million of them, okay? Whereas cones are actually responsible for encoding the colors. Right, so rod, if, if, if your cones die, you can still see the world in black and white, so as to say, uh, right? Your rods are not responsible for encoding color at all, but cones are completely responsible for encoding color. And they're actually much lower in number compared to rods. They are like roughly 5 million or so, like in human retina. And they're mostly concentrated only in fovea. Okay. And so some really fun and just useful observations which we have through here, like immediately, there are some terms which you sometimes see in like compression and signal processing coming out of like literally just this diagram. Uh, so the first like sort of fun observations, fun observation really is like rods, which are responsible for encoding intensity are actually extremely sensitive sensors. Like you can even detect a single photon, like rods transduce even a single photon incidence on them, which is like, if you think about it, it's just like amazing, right? Um, and, oh, sorry. just like a cool fact. So uh, thanks Noah for sharing that information. But I guess like the real point is we have really good sensors in terms of like responding to intensity, uh, which, which exists in eye. Um, and actually very interestingly, rods are responsible to our adaptation to like wide range of contrast, which we see in real life. So when I say wide range of contrast, like think about you waking up, uh, it's a completely dark room and then you suddenly go outside in, in, in brightest sun, California sun, right? There is huge amount of intensity change. Now think doing the same thing with a camera, right? Like so camera, it's really hard to capture that much amount of dynamic range as it's called. And like real world has, I think, of the order of 10 raised to power 9 in some sense, like dynamic range, which we as humans encounter, 
okay and it's really hard to design like actually engineer engineer systems with this much amount of dynamic range but our eyes are actually amazing at it right so immediately you won't be able to see anything but after a while you are suddenly able to see most things very clearly right and that's happening because of something called adaptation of like how much these uh, um, these transducers in particular like rods are responding to the different amount of light and this kind of leads to something called Weber's law which is an extremely common psychophysical phenomena when it comes into like sensory world all Weber's laws law is saying like is the just noticeable difference so if you were given two, dif two different stimulus let's say they were the same intensity and you have been asked like okay which one has higher intensity Obviously, you will like, let's say, randomly pick 50 of each of them, right? But now, let's say I keep on increasing the intensity of one of these signals. At what point can I, let's say, conclusively say that, okay, this one is brighter than the other one? So that's kind of telling you the least count of measurement in some sense, like of what you can do in terms of intensity. And what's really amazing about human vision is that this least count, like the just noticeable difference of luminous, luminescence, is actually proportional to the amount of luminescence. Okay. So if you are in a dark room, extremely dark room, you might be even able to detect like extremely small light changes. But let's say if you are outside in the sun, it's really hard to detect those changes, right? Uh, let me give another example, which maybe people might relate more with. Like if you are reading a laptop back in your room, you don't change the brightness, you don't change the contrast, just take it out uh, in the sunlight. It's really hard to sometimes like read like what's, what's being written, for example. Right? This, is, this is an extreme example. There are other effects in play as well. This is not the only explanation of that, but it's, it's, it's a very common psychovisual phenomena. Like it's, it's present in audio, it's present in uh, video, it's present in like our senses, like the physical force we can feel, like temperatures which we can detect, so on and so forth. And this has like an immediate implication. So now let's think you are encoding an image, right? Like I'm encoding an image um, and I introduce a intensity difference in the image of one in a dark region of the scene and I introduce intensity difference of again like one one level one intensity level in extremely bright region of the screen right do you think these are equally proportional like for we as humans would perceive them at same level any thoughts which one do you think Okay, no one. So, okay, based on Weber's law, actually, like in bright region, it will be hard for me to detect that extremely small change. Whereas in dark region, I might be able to detect that extremely small change even then. So, it sort of says that, like, okay, like if there are certain visual artifacts which are coming in terms of like encoding, they might be less visible if those artifacts have small amplitude in terms of like mean square error, but they are happening in brighter regions than in darker regions. Right, so like immediate implication, and this is true for like again, like a lot of sensory systems. Yeah, is that why for uh, when you're like minimizing for image compression, like uh, um, perceptual metric, that the image gets smoothed out and yeah, basically just smooth out like so, like areas where kind of just be kind of average over? Uh, so not that, really. Like, that so, I think the specific question which you are asking is like when you encode with perceptual metric and you're trying to optimize over that in that case like rate becomes important right like sharp regions might you you might have to spend more bits to encode them than like a smooth region just because they have like think of in terms of predictive coding which uh, we have seen during image compression right you will have to basically store more diffs uh, compared to whatever the baseline is like a smooth signal is always easier to encode than a uh, spatially varying signals. So I think there it's 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 slightly a different effect than this one. Yeah, but visually you wouldn't see it a much bigger change because it's going through a fog. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. If if you be, yeah, this is actually uh, yeah easy to see. You can you can literally like have some, let's say random, <laughs> even salt and pepper noise. Have them in a very bright region of a picture. Have them in a very dark region of a picture, and you will clearly notice when it's happening in a dark region of the picture, but won't really notice it when it's happening in the bright region. Okay. And then the second property actually which comes across is okay, we like yeah. So this is also like implant, let's say in the gray scale here. Mm -hmm. The pixel level changes from 344 mm -hmm. to 345. Whereas if the pixel level changes from say 354, mm -hmm. then that 34 change is not really. So I want to say 
yes from basic first principle but the answer is no uh, because i have been hiding a lot of things like i said like i've been i've been using this word intensity very 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 loosely right in our human eyes like whether it's 0 to 255 like how it's encoded like that number has no meaning the meaning really is what's the amount of intensity like physical intensity which is falling in my eyes given some background intensity to which i'm already adjusted right so uh so essentially like it depends on like some some of the things which we'll cover like the, it depends on like color spaces there are like visual thresholds um there, there are like even standards itu standards which talk about visibility thresholds so for example visibility thresholds for standard uh, component is very different than hd component hd tv components and so on and so forth but you can there have been like these proper studies where you can map it back to something pixel wise uh, but again it depends there's like a big star mark <laughs> there so like don't don't do that like if you're designing a compressor don't be like oh we talked about weber's law let's just introduce like all the one one <laughs> distortions and like uh, the higher intensity region it won't work as simply as that because like at the end of the day you have to think about how exactly that number which we are saying like intensity encoded as 255 or 138 physically being translated into something which is falling into human eyes this is more about like how humans respond to intensity and yeah like i think the really i can forward it to you later really good thing is there are standards so there are like different visibility thresholds and when you change that like even in one of my past projects i've used that and it, it makes a difference like when you uh, when you kind of incorporate them like properly okay yeah so the second thing is like so okay rods are amazing uh but actually cones are amazing in themselves too and actually most of the spatial acuity or like essentially like the high spatial sampling which we are doing or the high quality vision which we are getting are, is actually happening because of cones okay so cones are actually densely sampling the visual scene which you are working with uh, but most of them are just concentrated around the uh, fovea like they are completely just concentrated on the fovea um, and so this basically results in, in the fact that like when we are actually sampling this scene it's not uniform sampling it's not like okay we have like every two degrees we have we have a sensor and we are we are actually recording from that rather what we have is that we have an extremely high quality vision at at fovea and as soon as you start going to the periphery your vision quality of vision starts decreasing significantly so again like you can do this experiment take the hand in front of you just like completely focus like just trying to see in front and now keep moving your hand to the right and you will see that like the sort of if if i were to say it in a way like the quality like the reconstruction of your hand is reducing as you move your hand towards the right okay and so the way humans uh, human retina like the way we make up for the fact that okay this is this is what we have as sensor system is by something what we call foveation or like so in a sense like when you are actually looking at this scene like it seems like maybe a static scene mostly static scene to me uh, that like okay mostly people are sitting and like okay this is the image which i am getting in whatever visual angle but in reality what's really happening is something called saccades you actually are continuously moving your fovea in all different directions. So you are doing extremely dense sampling at different points in this spatial region and extremely low uh, spatial sampling in other regions. So even in this like perfectly static scene, my eyes are, con the way my eye works is like it's continuously moving in different directions so that my this zero degree angle spot is actually sampling different regions in this space. Okay, and this is something called foveation and for those of you who are maybe into vr games and so on and so forth foveation actually is something which has been started like uh, has been used now and like people are working really actively on it from research perspective to use it for generating high quality images at extremely low bit rates in like 3d scene settings for example and people have actually also tried to use it for like um for better compression which we'll talk about for like sort of realizing that like you know not everything in an image or a video is equally important to a human viewer yeah. and again like all of these things like are coming from really fundamental simple properties of just like how how the rods and cones are distributed over the retina cool any questions so far yeah 
might have to rush a bit, but let's see. Okay. So in this plot now, basically what I'm showing is like, if you even go slightly deeper, there are actually three types of cones. And these are called L, M, and S cones, sort of for long, medium, and small. Um, and the idea is this, this L, M, S cone, so long, medium, and short. Uh, basically, these are again sensors, right? Like these are sensing the colors. And color physically is just different wavelength of light in the visible spectrum. Like what is red? It's, it's just like some part of the wavelength uh, in the EM waves, which are essentially falling, falling in your eyes. And so these sensors basically, like if you look at cones, basically have peaks at like different regions of the wavelength. So x-axis is the wavelength. Y-axis is sort of, you can think of it as normalized response to that wavelength. And you see like, for example, the long cones basically respond to higher spectrum of the wavelength compared to, let's say, the short cones, which are responding to the shorter uh, spectrum of the wavelength. Okay. And now, like, can anybody just like, Answer me, like, what do you think is the significance of these LMS cones? Like they can, don't care as much for blue, but like they're, I'll give you the blue, blue camera. Actually, that's, that's an interesting take, but no. <laughs> um, there is, you can do that, but we don't really get to that much uh, detail. But that's, that's a very sharp observation. That's indeed true and there are reasons to it. I'm happy to talk why it happens, how it happens. But for now, let's not worry about it. So this is actually just the reason why you have this RGB, right? Like, why is everyone in the world suddenly like RGB, RGB, RGB? Why, why does like Kedar represent all his images starting with inputs as three channels? Why not 20 channels? Why not 50? Why not one? Right? Like, we should ask those questions. Like, why three? And so the reasons why we have this RGB color model is because of like, this sort of cone properties. Do you know in biology why are the cones red for green instead of the primary colors red for more? Uh, who defined the primary colors? Like it's it's a nomenclature thing, right? Like how do you like the primary colors? I think historically the term even comes from like trichromatic theory back in eighteen hundreds, <laughs> like. People had them in painting and then they realized, like, uh, I, I'm forgetting who, I think Faraday maybe, he, uh, someone really old, <laughs> I'm forgetting the name, uh, realized that it's because of, like, you know, maybe there are three different sensors in our eyes which we are looking at. But, but hold on to your thought. I'm going to give you some more information and then we'll talk again about it. But hold on to it. Okay. So, yeah, so this is called tri trichromatic theory of color vision. Okay. But in reality, like we haven't really rigorously talked about like colors, right? Like we have just been saying RGB and that's it, like putting things under the hood, right? But what exactly is a color model? Like is RGB really special? Like it's sacred second. Why can't we have RGY or RBY? Um, so on and so forth, right? Um, in practice, yes, you can have. And like color models are basically just, uh, in some sense, you can think of it as. Uh, a quantitative way or, or some space to represent colors in, in, in a um, quantized manner, right? So for example, this is a color. These two colors are, you should see them exactly as same. And okay, some of these slides, I'm pretty sure camera people will not be able to, like people who are seeing recording might not be able to see properly, but at least for the class, like you can see these are exactly the same colors. Okay? And then you can represent these colors as RGB, which is like 224, whatever, like this is the RGB configuration. Or you could actually also write it as like CMYK. This is like another color model some of you might have heard. It's like commonly used in printing. Um, and the basic idea here is that like you get the exactly same thing. So you could have represented the, uh, the exact same um, color information either as RGB or as a CMYK. You are not really losing anything. And both of them would have been fine. So let's say if I was building a machine learning model on, on CMYK, I don't know why I would be doing, but let's say I'm doing that. In that case, I'll start with four channels, for example. Each of them will have C, M, Y, K information instead of three for RGB. And RGB is something called like additive colors, which is like this all has like historical context also. Like, so like back in the days when you used to have printing press, C, M, Y, K colors used to make more sense because of how physically printing works. And you have, uh, these are called subtractive colors because when you add them, that results in black and you want maybe black print on white paper more. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's, that's the thing, but okay, here I'm just, I just talked about two color spaces in reality, color spaces is probably much more complicated topic, uh, than, uh, than, than you might imagine if you have never thought of it. Okay. 
So we are not going to discuss this in detail in the class at all. So like catch me later if you want to learn more about it. But essentially in world there are like many, many, many different color spaces, especially as of today. So there, so what I'm showing here on the right, uh, don't worry about the axis. I'm not going to explain it, but like if you already know about this, this is called chromaticity diagram in particular CIE 1931 XY chromaticity diagram was back in 1931, somebody thought of like, okay, let's represent the color in this way. Um, these are essentially like physically normalized uh, luminosities, if I remember correctly. So uh, that's how like you get these XY diagram. Like this weird oval shape thing which you see on this XY diagram is actually the range of human colors. These are like all the colors which we can see. Anything beyond it, we can't see, okay? And then different digital systems or analog systems as they were designed, uh, sorry, different just color spaces as they were being used during transmission, encoding all these process, um, were basically different subsets of sort of this hue. Like in, in, if, you, if you want to see in this XY space. So there is something called sRGB, which um, like back in the day, like if you, if you forget everything about HD and, and all those things, it used to be the most standard color space. Then at some point, Adobe came up with Adobe RGB, which was a much richer color space. And like people really loved Photoshop at that point because you could get like much more vibrant colors. But then it became really hard to like correlate, like because at the end of the day, what you care is this end result, right? You don't really care of like how exactly you are representing it. And now like there are there are much, there are many more color spaces. So there is like a different color space for HDTV, which is even more vibrant. So you can see even more colors. So when you go uh, and by, let's say, displays your latest TV, you might hear this terms like, okay, for HD TV, like this is the color range dynamic, or this is, like if you go into the technical specifications, they would even have like color spaces, so on and so forth. So this is just to give you a sense that color space is, everyone knows RGB, everyone is comfortable with it. We have been taught about it forever. But in practice, like as soon as you go in, let's say industry, and you're actually trying to design these image systems, end to end, it becomes like a really important and like tricky subject to deal with. Okay, and so just to just to show you something more, let's have some fun. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, load. Okay, nice. So let's do this exercise. Okay. Everyone do this, like with all your intensity, all your like proper intention, everyone with me. Focus on this uh, X cross. Anybody see anything funny happening on this side? Yeah. It's green. Okay, that's nice. Now remove the remove your focus from X completely. I don't see any green actually. I'm just like walking by. <laughs> right? Something very interesting. Like what's happening? Right? Like color space wise, like you're suddenly being introduced to like green when there is actually just a pink ball which is sort of missing. And this is linked so you guys can play with it. Uh, is my presentation. Huh. Um, Okay, so this, this is one of my favorite illusions because it's like really easy to see, like one of my favorite color illusions, like very fast to see like what's happening. It's called, it's called lilac chaser because you were trying to chase lilac color. Um, some of like, okay, next, like what, which color do you see on this dress? Like if some of you recall at some point this broke the internet and led to families splitting, <laughs> like. So like, okay, show of hands, how many of you see like gold and white here? And actually me as well. How many of you see something else? <laughs> like blue and what? Blue and black. Blue and black. So, okay, so roughly, I guess half half split given statistical variance of this many people. So I see completely gold and white, uh, sorry, yellow, uh, sort of yellow and white. But I know a lot of people like are completely convinced that this is a blue and black dress. And so like, uh, this kind of led to even bigger debates. Like people have tried to explain how lilac chaser works and there are theories as to why it works and we'll see actually, and that has implications for us already. Uh, but over past two years, there have been some really interesting papers and apparently the core reason is sort of similar. So in the previous one, there seemed to be like missing red. You were sort of perceiving it as green. 
right, at some point for some reason, right. Here, the competition is between blue and yellow, it, it seems, right, like there is something happening with blue and yellow. Uh, that's, that's like negating to each other. And this is another fun, fun actually, uh, let's actually do it, uh, fun example. Okay, so everyone with me, this one requires a bit more concentration than the lilac chaser one, okay. So I want you to focus on uh, the left side of this painting at the nose of Mona, Mona Lisa, like complete concentration, 30 seconds, like just look at the nose, nothing else. Okay, now immediately see to the white part of this image. Um, <laughs> I see one gasp. <laughs> what happened? I, I, see, I see the real Mona Lisa. Oh, you saw the real Mona Lisa as soon as you shifted, right? So this is amazing. Like, what's happening? What, what are we doing? Like, I just showed you a white image. Like, why are you? Why did you started hallucinating Mona Lisa suddenly, right? And so phenomena like this is actually very. Like you try to understand all of these phenomena, like visual illusions actually point to something very specific which is happening in how our eyes are perceiving the physical stimulus. And the phenomena which you just saw is called retinal after image and actually has similar roots to the next thing which we are going to discuss <laughs> in, in this thing. So I talked about trichromatic theory of vision which is like RGB, right? But there is also uh, like around 80 years later to whosoever proposed RGB, like we had this opponent process theory of color vision, which basically said, said that, okay, even though cones are LMS and like cones are something which is encoding RGB information, we are not really transmitting RGB information back to the brain. We are rather doing some, let's say, pre-processing on top of it. And that's the information which we are actually transmitting back. And one of the reasons for that hypothesis was actually Sean, right? Uh, your name is Sean. Yeah, yeah, like one of the reasons for that hypothesis actually was a very sharp observation by Sean when I when I showed this plot. It seemed that red and green green have like a lot of overlap, right? Whereas blue didn't seem to have a lot of overlap. So it would be extremely wasteful to like encode, let's say, each of these signals coming from red, green, and blue, thinking they are IID. They are not, right? Um, and so that was kind of the initial reason why people guessed that, okay, maybe there is something more happening. And then there was all these observations that, like paint, painters, I'm not a painter, so if somebody is correct me if I'm going to, going to say something wrong, but it's very hard to like, let's say get combinations of red green together or blue yellow together, but you can get like colors which are red yellow and like blue, uh, blue green, so on and so forth. So these observations like people, people hypothesize, okay, that there is something else happening. We are not really encoding that. And the hypothesis which they came up with is called like this opponent process theory, which is basically saying instead of RGB, we have these three opponent channels. So there is like a white black channel, which is just encoding like the uh, intensity. So you are saying, okay, either it's white or black, white or black. And then there is blue, yellow, and similarly red, green. And you can form this like again, starting from the LMS cones on the top, right? But like there is some post-processing in the middle and let's say this is what you're transmitting back to the brain. Okay. Um, and so this is actually the reason why we, this can explain like actually, for example, lilac chaser illusion. So what happens when you are focusing on the cross is that you are seeing a lot of red in some sense. And so eventually you have this adaptation in the eye which suppresses the red signal. That's why I've been asking you to focus at one spot, right? Because that eventually leads to like adaptation of the eye. And so you start reducing the red signal. So, so as to say, you start responding less to the red intensity which sort of starts perceiving you as, let's say, green, uh, greenish uh, color. So this is like somewhat explains like what's happening. And just to be technically correct here, like uh, it's still a hotly debated topic, whether this is like correct model, whether you have like, let's say, single cells which respond to like blue, yellow, red, green, black, white, so on and so forth. At some point, people believe that that's the case. Um, I'm not on top of like the current literature, but few years back at least or like five years back it was still somewhat debated like whether what, what's the perfect color model in humans. Yeah. So on that breast thing, mm -hmm. the breast, is the issue that we are on that border like the blue yellow we are almost close to zero and for some reason it, it like that. So I haven't, uh, so 
this, this, this has actually led to very serious technical publications by like color psychophysicists trying to analyze like why this is happening because if you think about like other examples, they were artificially made, but this just happened naturally and people were completely divided. Um, one of the hypotheses which I have read, I don't know if it's correct or not, is basically more like somebody showed statistically that people who wake up early in the morning versus people who stay up late at night have different responses to it. Uh, just because like people who wake up early in the morning are more used to like the uh, the yellow light versus people on the other end are less used to it. So you adapt accordingly, basically like so. Uh, but I'm not sure if that explains. So I think this is uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I don't know like if it has been conclusively resolved, like why that's the case and why, why there was so much debate about it. Which one is this? Why not go early? Sorry, go on. Is for me, it's gold and white. What's for you? Uh, oh, sorry. So I think, uh, let's see. So it was gold and white for people who were early wakers, I think. That's what that's what the guess was. So it, it fails for me. So I, I, don't, I don't believe this hypothesis because like, okay, this paper says they statistically saw it, but I don't wake up early, but I see it yellow and white so I don't trust that. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, let's continue. I think I might have to rush a lot towards the end otherwise because these things are fun. But okay, so we talked about all of this, like where does it all tie? So this is, these exact three colors are the reason for something called uh, YCBCR or YUB, which is a very common perceptual color coding, which you will see a lot. Actually, it's used in JPEG. It's used even more aggressively during video compression, like any video compression tool, which you will see will have something to do with YUV. And the reason this YUV came up, like, so this is just recall, like how JPEG compression worked. You had RGB, you had some color transformation. So this, this was like the place where Kedar said, okay, like you do some color space and he just went away from it. Let, he didn't talk about it at all. And then we were doing like the standard things like block splitting, DCT, quantization, so on and so forth. Okay. And Kedar said like quantization sort of is the only place where actually loss gets introduced. But actually in JPEG, you also introduce the loss at the color transformation steps many times. And we'll, we'll see the reason why, like and why it's fine to do that and why it really works. Um, just to like, like this has confused me for a while, so I don't want people getting confused, but you might hear terms like YUV, Y-UV, YCBCR, Y-CBCR, all these different terms. For today's purpose, they are the same thing. But again, like, come catch me if you want to learn more. The dashes is because of like gamma, something called gamma correction. If you are doing that, if you have heard of this before in displays or any other places, that's why there is this dash. And UV and CBCR. So UV exists because of like, again, legacy reasons. Like when there was analog TV, there were like UV channels. And so people used to call it UV with modern digital signaling, it's called CBCR. But again, people people use these terms in a very lax way. So you'll see like YUV for videos, essentially it's similar to CBCR. So just, just be careful, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so any guesses like, so the first step here is color transformation. So I think one answer I have been yelling so far. So one answer should be obvious, like why do, why do we do this? Why do we go from RGB to YCBCR? That's how our eye sees it, exactly. Like that's the reason one, like why people thought of doing it. And because it's a perceptual color space and it's based on like the opponent process. This is how our eye see it. So maybe we should encode it in this way because these are, this is like somewhat decorrelating the information in RGB channel, like transform coding, which we have been seeing. And we know that eyes do it. So let's also do it. Like that might lead to proper signal separation for, for our eyes. And then the second reason it's actually a bit more involved. I, don't expect anyone to guess it if you haven't really seen it before. And that's just because of different contrast sensitivity of your different channels of your Luma and then blue, yellow and green, red sort of channels. And what I mean by that is this. So like this is another fundamental, I would say, one of the principal psychovisual phenomena, which if, if, if you have to take away two, three psychovisual phenomena, I would say definitely take away this contrast sensitivity phenomena. And what is contrast? So contrast is your ability to again like detect differences between signals which are nearby. 
okay like so if if you have a smooth image completely it has low contrast if you have extremely sharp features then it has high contrast okay and here on the left axis like what i'm showing contrast sensitivity for humans depends on two main things like obviously it depends on the intensity right like how much the two signals differ you might be able to uh, detect the difference but it also depends on like the spatial frequency at which signals happen and so like here what's happening is as you go down on the x-axis your contrast is increasing so for me this is all gray i can't see anything but as i start going down i start seeing some level differences below it's perfectly visible to me and then as you go ahead on the x-axis you are increasing the spatial frequency so from i can see like if i look here like bars kind of becoming closer and closer okay and the idea is really like your contrast sensitivity behaves somewhat like this uh, like a hum shaped function so for me here i see complete gray i i can actually see some line differences here so it, it's gonna be different for different people like we obviously have different eyes so we have different let's say sensitivity to these things uh, but for me at least like this region is perfectly gray this region is perfectly gray i can see some contrast here i can actually see most of this contrast okay so even if this thing is exactly gray there is actually some radiation present there so now you can think of it from the other axis right like let's say if i was encoding a signal which actually had some contrast which was happening in like this region of of the curve and like let's say all of the humans can't differentiate between those two pixels or so as to say those two contrast in that case i never need to actually encode it right like it doesn't matter nobody is anyway is going to be able to see it we have human limitations okay right? and this is exactly like why contrast sensitivity is very important and again this is hand wavy because i haven't really defined how i'm exactly defining contrast like whether it's pixel difference whether it's relative pixel difference whether it's intensity difference luminosity difference blah 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 doesn't matter like the takeaway point is that this guy contrast sensitivity function has a hump shaped kind of curve with spatial frequency where the maximum contrast sensitivity you get like around like some 1 to 10 cycles per degree and here degree is same the visual degree we talked about okay and now this is this is for luminescence so this is the hump shaped curve for luminescence but if you look at yellow blue or red green channel you see something different you see that your contrast falls much more sharply and it just falls it just dies down at much much lower spatial frequency so let's say if i have a signal which is varying at a spatial frequency of 10 hertz uh, actually 10 cycles per degree in that case the only thing i'm going to be able to discern in that signal is the intensity i can't tell you the colors of that and this is exactly what we are going to use in helping us encode these signals better okay uh, any questions before i talk about this like like people are clear about the okay. sure uh, cool so yeah exactly i guess so this contrast sensitivity curve actually has lots of implications for us and all of them are exploited in jpeg so the first one is like we saw that the, the you do much more quantization of higher frequency dct components than lower frequency dct components like kedar talked significantly about it like quantization tables were much larger on the below right that's coming because of this hum shaped curve <laughs> essentially okay but then there is also this phenomena of chroma subsampling again very common in image and video uh, compression and then people using separate quantization matrices for like the luma and chroma components like you do different amount of quantization for luma and chroma all of which is basically coming from like because people back when jpeg was being designed 1980s were aware of it and uh, they they fixed it like they they designed the compressor trying to exploit this so let's just quickly talk about what chroma subsampling means so all chroma subsampling is doing is that you downsample the color information in cb and cr channels so you will hear terms like yuv or ycrcb444 420 so on so forth maybe 420p things like that so what this numbers really mean is that like okay so for four pixels in horizontal direction okay how many pixels am i storing color for so in this case let's say i have this 2 by 4 brick so when i'm storing this information in ycrcb i'm going to have one value for each of these four blocks 1 2 3 4 and i'm going to have one value each 
for CR and CB channel as well. So like one, two, three, four. So like how basically exactly same size, uh, uh, same number of pixels irrespective of which channel it is. Okay. And then the third number is basically saying that am I essentially changing anything in second row, like in the row below. So for example, in 444 case, I'm not. I'm, I still have four different colors for the second row. So YUV or YCRCB444 is basically lossless. It's very common. You are basically storing all the information, right? Oops. You are storing all the information. You are keeping same number of Luma pixels, same numbers of chroma or both the chroma pixels, so on and so forth. But now you can think that, okay, like I, I don't really perceive colors at the sharp frequencies, right? I can only perceive chroma maybe at the fre frequencies I'm working at at different pixels. So let me, let me do something else. Let me actually do a low pass filtering or anything. Like basically just save one color value for two pixels instead of storing two color values. For example, in the above image, you were storing eight different color values. So eight, eight different CR values, eight different CB values. But in this case, you are only storing four CR values and four CB values. So you're throwing away information. You can immediately see like you have thrown away some information in the data. And this is what's called 422. So again, four is just four blocks of Luma I'm looking at. First two is saying I'm basically have two different color pixels. So I have down sampled by two. I have half different colors in first row. And then the next number is basically it's going to be either previous number or zero. We'll, we'll see the implication of that. But basically it's saying like uh, how many colors do I have like as I go to the next row. So again, I have two. Okay, so that's 422. Similarly, 420. 42 is same. So if I look at first row, I have four pixels. Again, I have combined two, two pixels, right? But now in 420, the next row, I am not changing anything. So I have exact same blue colors. So here, basically, I have represented, again, a block of eight colors. Uh, sorry, a block of eight pixels with only two colors, essentially. Not two colors, two values of CR, two values of CB. So technically, four colors. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so the way we're changing the colors is we're like we're combining blocks, but the way we're changing the Y is just like the quantization. Yeah. So imagine like this was your original signal Y C R C B. So remember like uh, when you start, you have some RGB information. You can just so I'll I'll show you Y C B C R is just a matrix multiplication. It's a linear color space transformation. I Maybe I should have had that earlier, but it's basically a linear color space transformation. So from this RGB values, you get like YCRCB values. You will get like the 444 values, basically. But now you can choose to do chroma subsampling, which is a lossy step, right? You are just throwing away information immediately. You are saying, I don't need to store this much, this, these many colors, because I can't sense them. And this is, this is what you will see like commonly used, like for example, YUV 420 is extremely commonly used in like video compression, like all, all the time. So like you can imagine, this is a, this is a very good way to get like some compression benefits, right? I'm immediately throwing away a lot of pixels, a lot of data without hopefully any, um, any implications for the uh, distortion. And so like, yeah, this is just an example of what this chroma subsampling looks like. So you start with this RGB, you do some linear conversion into Y, C, B, C, R. So you can see C, B is blue, yellow, C, R is somewhat red, green. You can see that. Um, and then you basically downsample. So 420 is sort of downsampling it by half. So if you look 420, that's sort of downsampling it by half. So you downsample the UV components and that's what you store and then independently process each of these channels. So like in RGB, operations were symmetrical. But now you'll have different operations for Luma and the color channels. Okay. And this is just an example of like a patch of this image. Uh, don't worry about the exact numbers because this image has alpha channel and it's, it's stored with PNG with some overhead. But essentially like when you have no downsampling, like a patch of this image goes from 429 KB to 352 KB. And like if you are like me, I think you shouldn't see any difference. <laughs> You might have sharper eyes, but I don't really see any difference. And you immediately get like rate benefit. And this is without lossy compression, by the way. This is just if I do chroma downsampling and losslessly save it. But now on top of it, you can do lossy compression, right? And we know like we have seen this in predictive coding, like as soon as you have blocks of pixels, which are much more similar to each other, your lossy compression can even improve further, right? It, 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 you have broad, you have low pass filtered the value, so you can 
gain even higher advantages. So it's not just advantages from throwing away pixels, it's also advantages by reducing, let's say, the variance in the signal, right? And so if you further compress them, compress them with JPEG, like this 429 actually gets to 323, but this 352 actually gets all the way down to 176. And again, like, uh, there will be some difference, but hardly, hardly any, like it's very hard to spot the differences between the two. So this is like extremely cool way to get like extract a lot of bitrate saving just by exploiting the perceptual properties of how humans work, right? So uh, yeah, sort of pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna go a little bit fast or I can actually, never mind. We'll have to cut down some of the material for today's class, but it's okay. Uh, yeah. So one of the problems with this subsampling though is like you need to be careful when you introduce all these lossy components, right? You need to be careful about what kind of artifacts they can introduce, even though visually we might not see them, but there might be certain cases where you can actually see them. So essentially when you are doing this downsampling, you are doing low pass filtering, right? So suppose you had a very sharp red edge, uh, red box for 444, when you actually do a 420 kind of um, compression, so the way you are going to do this 4 to 0 is you're going to average pixel 1 and 2 to result in this color, right? Like for, for the 4 pixels, so on and so forth. So you are essentially doing a low pass filtering, right? So what this is going to do is it's going to make, it's not a good image on this projector, but anyways. So what it did was like it made this 2 by 2 sharp red block into like some diffuse color block in the middle. So chroma subsampling, like if you are doing, you need to be careful. Like if, you're, if you really want very vibrant colors, it's going to have some adverse effects. You are reducing the uh, spatial frequency. So you do need um, to ensure the kind of images you are working at is good. So for example, if you have sharp color images, like again, depending on at what intensity you are seeing, you can, uh, you can maybe see like two lines around the edge. Like at least I can see it from this angle. I don't know if you guys can see it. Uh, like go home and look at these slides as well. We'll upload them. So. So like if you have sharp color boundaries and you actually want to maintain them, I am uh, Leland Junior Stanford. I'm really, I really care about my logo. I really want those sharp lines in there. In that case, if I do chroma subsampling, it's going to hurt me. Like I'm going to introduce, I'm going to smoothen out the boundaries. I'm going to have some color diffusion around it. So you need to be careful about that. This is like another example of the same thing. Like this is just a terminal text actually. And I have like sharp, it's not sharp, like let's say sharper red and green colors here. And when I do chroma subsampling, now this is what I get. Like my contrast <laughs> decreases significantly and even seems like the color has sort of shifted because of that contrast decrease. So again, like seems like a free lunch, but it's not free lunch. You need to be careful when you are going for it and like what kind of images you are going, images or videos you are doing it for. Okay. Um, and then like what, sorry, actually I'll pause here for a second. Any questions? Everyone with me? Oh, nice. Um, so yeah, there was a question earlier by Sudeep, right? Yeah, by Sudeep that like, okay, like, but what exactly is this YCBCR, right? Um, so essentially these are linear transformations, but the answer is actually not that simple. I wish I could just give you a formula and say like, go home, you're done, use this formula. Uh, these are perceptual spaces <laughs> in some sense. And so like, I briefly touched about how color spaces depend on perception. Similarly, your YUV depends on color spaces. And including me, like I at least know five different people who have at some point working on their image or video compression project have wasted at least a week or more debugging some issue, which at the end of the day was just like the issue of realizing that, hey, the conversion matrix which I'm using is not the same as what I use, uh, as someone else used at some point or what I, I was using for debugging. So this is like saving a lot of time. What I'm trying to say is like, as soon as you go from RGB to YUV, just be a little bit careful while working on it, on like what you are working with. And to give you an example, there is something called like ITUR. So this is just recommendation by ITU. Uh, I think it's International Telecommunication Union, which gives like a lot of recommendations. And it's called BT601 conversion, doesn't matter. But this is like a standard conversion which was used with like RGB, SDTV color space. And this is sort of like the linear, linear conversion formula. Values doesn't matter, just to show you what it looks like. But now there is also something called ITUR BT709, which is 
use with HDTV color space. I don't think this should be sRGB. I think that's a typo, but yeah. So it's used with HDTV color spaces. So depending on like how somebody converted your data to YUV, ideally, like if you look at it closely, it, it, it will also have like this color space conversion information about how it was done. Cool. Uh, any questions? Okay. So finally, last thing, like in JPEG, which we haven't covered, and after this, we have basically covered almost everything in the JPEG at least, is that you actually use different quantization matrices for Lumen Chroma components. So again, if you recall, like image compression, Kedar shows these quantization matrices where you have some 8x8 eight eight DCT blocks, like you have some 8x8 eight eight 2D DCT transform. The lower left represents like lower spatial frequency. This represents like higher spatial frequency. And then he showed this matrix, which just like the base quantization matrix, which works at some particular quality, where you have lower values on the left. So you are basically quantizing it less. And you have higher values at the bottom right, which was basically quantizing it more. So you were throwing away more information in bottom right than in top left, right? Uh, so we have already seen this, but just to be clear, JPEG actually uses two different quantization matrices for Luma and Chroma. And if you look at Chroma 1, it's much more aggressive in quantization. Like, like literally from something like 3 by 3 or like whatever, like this whole is 99. Whereas here, like you get two values like 99 only at much higher spatial frequency. So you see like effect of like the contrast sensitivity is being different, literally being encoded in your JPEG quantization tables. Okay, um, I think I'll probably end here. I'm not gonna cover as I initially promised because I clearly missed just the amount of time it will take me. Uh, but uh, so this is like, I, I guess the final, let's say slide for today and we'll pause there after for question. So this is my Stanford logo. I just downloaded it online, saved it as JPEG. And I'm using something called Exif tool, uh, which is just, it's just a tool which prints out information about the encoding of this. Uh, uh, you, you can use it to uh, print out inform encoding information about, let's say, any image for on terminal. It's open source. You can download it. And so let's see what, what all things are we seeing. So we see that uh, whatever, like logo, download, blah, blah, blah. OK, interesting stuff comes. Like file type is JPEG. OK, we know what is JPEG. As soon as we see JPEG, we know this is this file is glossily compressed by someone, right? We have thrown away some of the source data. We immediately know that. Um, let's go down JFIF version. That's just JPEG file format. So JPEG is a compression, but you can have different file formats. How you save it, like metadata. For example, MP3 is not a sorry, MP4 is not a encoder, right? It's just a file format of how you save some some encoded video file. Similarly, JFIF is a file format. Uh, then there is X resolution, Y resolution. So that's just the number of pixels in X and Y, right? Makes sense. Uh, there is something called byte order, like exif byte order and orientation. This is just like how you actually write these as byte streams. So we have seen these things now, if you have worked with SCL, seen SCL. Um, yeah, Noah, just a few more minutes and then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we are done, <laughs> almost. Okay, so this is just like how you are saving this information actually as bits and bytes, sorry, I can't say, right? And now first interest, like first thing comes which you might have not known before, like you see color space and the color space here is sRGB. But now you have some understanding and appreciation of what this color space means. It could have been Adobe RGB, it could have been something vibrant, something more, but this is how this image was saved, right? Um, there is image height width, IPTC digest, like we don't have to worry. Um, then you see encoding process, and you see that it uses baseline DCT with Huffman coding, which is what we saw like JPEG uses, right? It uses some DCT followed by Huffman. And finally, you see things like bits per sample 8. So this is important, right? You can have higher bit depth image com co content. You can, like who said you only need to use a byte for each RGB? You could have used 10 bytes, 10 bits, 12 bits, so on and so forth. The reason we use 8 is like, again, has historical context, and mostly it works fine. But right now, like if you go in industry, you will see people are trying to move towards 10-bit content, 12-bit content, so on and so forth. And those are like quest for like more and more pristine content sort of going for that. Uh, you see color components is three, and then you see why CBC are subsampling, which is four to zero. 
in this case. So you know like how the color encoding was done. Okay. So like this is just like I think from here like going back if you can understand like given an image if somebody gives you an image they tell you some format and if you can look at an output like this and clearly understand and explain it to someone and argue the context of what's happening I think you have like more or less understood like practical image encoding at this point like you should be able to explain anything and okay I'm, I'm gonna stop here uh, but questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of curious, with like all like the big data and stuff that we have available these days, what do you think, like, could there be a future, and if so, how, how far out is it, where like we have truly individualized compression, where like we could use these conceptual compression methods to like optimize for individuals? Um, I don't know, I don't think I am experienced enough, worked in area enough, can predict like the projection trajectory of how fast things are going to go. But my sense is that like, I can tell you what's happening now. Um, so like I said, in the case of AR VR setting, people like, so it's very hard to do that if you think about in like laptop or TV setting, there's just like too many unknown variables you are working with, right? Like, I don't know the distance at which you are looking at from your TV, how big your screen is, like, how, are you sitting in California sunlight or I don't know, um, Seattle uh, rains where you are watching these things and all of these things completely change like you know I don't know how much variability does your and my eye have like I showed like we saw some perceptual plots like this plot obviously your and my eye will have different plots in some sense right uh, so there are all these really hard questions when it comes to like actually rigorously using human perceptual studies into engineering systems right but having said that, I think over time we have made significant progress. Like we have moved from like fixed quantization matrices as you see here to something which is sort of adaptive. Uh, we have seen like in VR AR case, for example, where it seems much more imaginable, where you can like control a lot of these settings. For example, I can control the display brightness. I can control the distance. I can control the ambient lightning, which is being thrown at my eyes. I can control a lot more things. There people have actually started to imagine and do things like exactly what you said. So for example, foveated compression, like what that means is like, I know my eyes are going to sample things like this. Why am I generating like the whole image in extremely high resolution? Let me, let's say do eye tracking and let me basically just generate high quality image at wherever my eye is like currently looking and have like extremely low quality image. But there then the issues come for like latency, like am I able to do it at the speed at which I moves and generate and change systems and do all that. But that's something which people are doing. Actually, even at Stanford, I think Keith uh, has some recent papers, so you can check that out. Um, so yeah, all I want to say is like, I can't predict when things are going to happen, but they are moving in that direction slowly and steadily. And VR actually is an amazing playground for that. Um, so you can check that out. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you, everyone.